Rachel Eban is the deputy leader of the Green Group on Mid Suffolk Council. Mid Suffolk is a place that you might have heard a lot about over the last week because it is the council, the first council anywhere in the country to have elected a green majority. And I'm going to be speaking to Rachel about how that majority came about and what the Greens' plans are for the council going forward. But before we delve into any of that, uh, Rachel, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Um, very well indeed, Chris. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me on today. It's, it's good to talk to you. Brilliant. Well, let's crack straight into it then. So, as I said, Mid Suffolk uh, saw the Green Party make history in this year's local elections. It's the first time ever anywhere that the party has taken majority control of a council. How did that happen? Um, a lot of hard work, <laughs> I suppose I'd say. I mean, we have had a, um, our first councillor here was 20 years ago. Um, 2003. Um, I myself was elected in 2010. Um, so we have had green um, councillors here for quite a long time. And I think the um, what people have liked locally is the fact that all the green councillors that they've seen um, in their communities um, work hard, really represent them and kind of value what, you know, what they want to achieve, value our communities, value their environment. And that has been noticed um, to, to, to the extent that in these elections, um, you know, we, we already had 12 councillors in the run up to um, these elections. And some we found that some um, electors were saying, well, we've seen, you know, in a community next door to us that there's green councillors and they work hard and we'd like some of that, please. And um, so over the last couple of weeks, um, some of the narrative that we've seen from some quarters has been that the Greens have been winning in traditionally Tory areas by leaning into sort of nimbyism, particularly on areas like house building. Um, do you think that's true? Not, not particularly, no. I think the, you know, we've seen, um, we're in a very rural area of Suffolk and we've seen a huge amount of development over the last um, five to 10 years. And part of that's down to, um, government's targets, house building targets, and part of it's down to the um, Conservatives and our council actually not doing enough to, to put in a um, local development plan in place so that um, we can actually um, guide those developments how that our communities want them. But what we found is that where we've had green councillors in place, we've actually been able to affect those developments. I mean, from the absolute simplest things such as saving trees that are, you know, it's like a, a classic one where a tree was in the way of a footpath, we'll move the footpath, you know, or ancient hedgerows, you know, do we really need to take out a hedgerow purely for a housing development? But to more sort of prosaic um, issues in terms of, you know, in my own community, we've got people who are um, not able to afford to live in the villages that they grew up in, and um, because they can't afford housing or there just is not housing available. You know, there's the kind of nice four or five bedroom executive homes, but not the two bedroom houses. But as green councillors, we've been able to actually um, work with developers, work with the community to say, look, can we can we change the housing mix? Can we get some more two bedroom homes? Can we get something that's more affordable? And so we've been able to do that. So I don't really think the nimbyism um, issue has is something that has you know, arisen here particularly. And I don't think that's a sort of valid argument from the from the Conservatives um, in this instance. I mean, you know, yes, people might say they don't want development but in their backyard. But when I speak to some people, I mean, I've got a classic example of someone actually coming up to me and saying, my grandson can now, is now able to live in the village down the road from me. You know, and so that particular person living in the village wanted that development so that their, you know, they could see their, you know, grandchildren, grandchildren actually be able to, to live there and not have to move away or whatever else. So I think there's this, you know, it's quite a complex picture. And, but I, I, I don't think that, um, you know, the nimbyism point really stands up to much scrutiny, really. And um, so you're now in administration. Uh, what are your priorities? So what does the first 100 days of a Green administration in Mid-Suffolk look like? Well, I, I think the interesting point on that, Chris, is that we've had, you know, over the last few years, we've, we've been constantly put ideas into the, you know, when the Conservatives were 
running the um, council on the based purely on the chair's casting vote, we would every year at budget time, we would put in our, our ideas for things that we wanted to see happen. Um, we would put motions forward to councillors. I'm sure lots of other um, councillors are, are fully aware of how that how that works. But n now some of those ideas, we can actually get them happening. So for example, last year we said, you know, there is not enough happening on um, insulating properties and actually making sure that existing homes are more um, environmentally efficient. Can we affect the cost of living crisis? Can we reduce people's housing bills? So we've got a project that's already got funding um, in the in the budget from last year that we need to get underway immediately so that that can actually impact this winter and we can actually get some insulation projects going. For example, that, that's one. We've had another um, one where there's a it's such a rural area here. We have a big problem with rural transport. You know, unless you've got a car, you know, there's, there are there are no no buses, you know, um, we had a, a classic example of a development in a village near me where um, as part of the development, the developer had to provide a bus stop. And we said, well, that's all very well, but there's not actually a bus to stop at the bus stop. So, um, you know, we want to work with the county council to work with voluntary groups to see if we can get some solutions for rural transport. Um, and that's not just um, people being able to access the, the town or access GP surgeries or whatever. It's kind of very social in terms of, you know, we find lots of elderly want to, when they travel on the on the bus, they talk to each other, they, you know, it helps with sort of isolation and so on. So looking at that, but I think kind of some of the real issues are kind of around about um, improving sort of access to the council. You know, it's been, it, it's been kind of rather distant and we haven't really asked communities, what do they want? What do they want the council to do for them? And so we're we're looking at how we can improve that and actually going to communities and asking them what what is it that you feel that you you need, you know what are the big issues or even the small issues in your area, um, and then I think in the first few months we really want to get to grips with, you know obviously we we know from kind of talking to our communities and from through the election process what some of the issues are, but actually you know show our communities that we can act on that and we can we can do some things that really will help, you know, in their um, sort of day-to-day -day lives and so on. So, so that's the short term, but so mid Suffolk, you have elections once every four years, uh, you have all out elections. So you're now in office for the next four years. What's the longer term vision for the district? Well, I think that we've, we've, you know, we've got a lot of plans. I mean, I think the, um, one of the, the key things, you know, as I said in the short term as well, is, is sort of reconnecting with, with our communities. Um, we, we want to kind of make our um, district much more, you know, vibrant in terms of kind of, you know, really um, exciting place to live. We want to improve the livability of it in terms of access to services, but also um, the rural economy, you know, not so people don't have to travel miles just to, to get to work that they're able to live and work in their own communities we want to kind of ensure that um, everyone has access to green spaces for example people think oh you live in a rural area and you've got you know lots of footpaths through farmland but you know a toddler can't play on a footpath through farmland a, a, a young you know 12 year olds can't build dens in in rural farmland so improving access to, to green spaces um, and and areas like that so looking at also the sort of culture and heritage of our district that don't we don't feel there's been enough sort of focus on bringing that to, to the fore not just um for the sake of its of, of culture and of people's enjoyment in that and so on but actually the kind of jobs that come with that the pride that comes with that and, and the community involvement so we've got a lot of plans and I think you know what we hope is that people know that we work hard and that we will see those things come to fruition and actually be able to progress them beyond beyond those four years and really make some positive changes um, that people are asking for. And so in the local elections a week or so ago now, whilst you were taking control of Mid Suffolk Mid Suffolk Council, um further south the Greens lost control of Brighton Hove. 
um, which is one of the other places where the Greens have been in administration. Um, it's the second time the Greens have been in administration in Brighton Hove and they've lost control once they've faced the electorate. What are the lessons that you think that you need to learn in Mid Suffolk from the Brighton Hove example um, that means that you don't endure the same fate in four years' time? Well, I think, you know, Brighton's a very, very different um, kettle of fish. Um, for starters, we're a very rural area um, in, in Brighton, you know, understanding it's kind of labour is is very is, has been very strong there we don't have any labour councils at all here haven't had any for absolutely years so um it's a very different um area and i think the actual issues that we face are extremely different so that's that's one point i think secondly because we've been steadily building so you know as, as i said we had 12 councillors um prior to this election. So we've we've been working hard in our communities and we know what the issues are. So we've just been steadily building um, on that. And I think that that is something that will, it's not been a sudden leap. You know, yes, the majority we, that we've got at the moment was slightly more than we expected, but we were expecting to get a majority. So I think that the sort of steady progress is something that will hold us in good stead. Um, it's not, a, it's not you know, all of a sudden that this has been um, achieved. And I think we're also we're very very focused on our communities so um one of the main areas really is actually listening to and talking to communities so um areas such as um community engagement and even setting the budgets you know looking at participatory bu budgeting proper participatory budgeting going out to the um communities and saying you know this is this is the money we have these are the services we want to provide what do you really want? What does what's important to you? What would you like us to be spending that that money on? They've they've never been asked that or haven't been asked that in, in years. And I think if we re-engage, you know, and reconnect those communities much more with their council and with what we're what the services we're providing, I think that will sort of stand us in in, in good stead, really. And so finally then, um our viewers may or may not know, but the mid suffolk district uh, has wards which cross over with the parliamentary constituency of Waverley Valley, which is the constituency which Adrian Ramsey, the co-leader of the Green Party, is standing in at the next general election. What do you think these elections mean for Adrian's chances of getting elected as the first MP for Waverley Valley? Well, I think if, um, you know, locally people have put their faith in us in terms of what we're, what we're going to address for them locally, and we need to follow that through. And I think it's our role really to kind of, you know, work on that and be able to show that that's, that's what can be delivered and that's what can happen. And I think with that, when people see that happening, you know, that they will then translate that um, to, to a national level. And, and hopefully that will, you know, provide us with a good springboard and Adrian with a good springboard to, to be elected as a, um, a Green MP in the, in the East. And I think to add to that, we've also got because in Suffolk, we've got so many more Green councillors elected. So um, not only do we have a majority and therefore administration at Mid-Suffolk, we've got the largest um, group on Baber District Council. We've got the largest group on East Suffolk District Council. So, you know, there is a, you know, huge amount of um, Green councillors in, in Suffolk. And I think that all provides a really good, strong base um, for Adrian in um, whenever there might be a, a general election. And if I were to ask you to look into your crystal crystal ball, do you think Adrian will be MP for Waverley Valley at the next election? Um, it's hard, it's hard to tell. I think it's be a really it will be a really tough um, competitive um, situation. But the interesting thing for us is there doesn't seem to be, you know, it's such a green area in terms of um, this this part of Suffolk now. That I think there's a very good possibility. Um, I think it would depend on on who the Conservatives put forward, for example, um, or not depend on, but it will be that will be you know part of the um, issue is who who they do to stand and and tellingly nobody has come forward yet um, on that front, so that's um that's very interesting, and so you know I think he's got a very very good good chance, um, and um, it would be so fantastic to see 
because we've shown that, you know, with the percentage of vote we got, I think, I'm just sorry, just checking my, my notes. I mean, we've got 57% of the vote at these elections. You know, you translate that um, into a kind of general election. I mean, that would be absolutely amazing. But that, the, you know, we have to make sure that one, we're working hard to actually make that happen. Um, and, you know, like I say, I think Adrian has got a very good chance and we would love to see that that happen, but you know, also needs to be replicated across the country as well. Rachel, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. That's okay. Very nice to join you, Chris. Thank you very much indeed.